Thank you. It's it's uh, quite a highlight of the event. Please. You know, I see the brochure, and they describe you as a visionary and innovation evangelist. But for me, it's a angel investor. And if you really look hard, you will even see the uh, the, the wings as kind of businesses that she has already invested on. Um, I wanted to start with, um, tell us a little bit about your latest investments. Okay, so my latest investments are pretty much like all my investments. They're, they're somewhat random, but fundamentally, I like to invest in things that are not redundant, that are not being done by somebody else, and that are useful. Uh, and then I, lo I want the people to be people I like. So I have a lot more... I have a lot less time and a lot less money, so I can't do everything, and therefore I can be completely biased, and you know I don't need to get all the opportunities that pass my way. I just need to pick the ones that actually excite me. So it's very different being an angel investor from being a, a, an institutional investor that needs to calculate IRRs and so forth. I just invest in things that I will be happy to invest in even if they don't work out. And they don't work out many times. Yeah, more often than not. Yeah. You know, but it's, you know, we have people probably in the audience who will think of approaching an investor. Yeah. You know, you, you say that you, you, your preference is the usefulness. You know, how do you make that decision? And what's, how, you know, what will be the advice for entrepreneurs how to approach an investor? Well, a lot of investors don't care about usefulness. <laughs> They'd rather invest in Uber for dog walkers. Yeah. Uh, if they think it will make a ton of money. And I'd rather make a ton of money doing something that will make me really proud. So the first thing to do is to understand which investor are you approaching and what will excite them. So I get emails all the time. Some people bother to find out who I am and some don't. The ones who don't bother to find out who I am, you know, I'm not going to find out who they are. The ones who do, they understand what is this investor interested in. If they've invested in something exactly like what I'm doing, no, that would be competition, so don't, don't even ask. If they've invested in something similar, but mine is fundamentally different, and it addresses the same need, but in a different way, or, you know, but find some reason that that investor is interested in you, then find someone you know that knows them. And don't just say, my friend thinks I should write to you. Get your friend to write to them. Don't do a cold call. Uh, and then write a very nice note explaining why you think they would be interested and why, how you feel their interest. It's, it's got to be very personalized to get through the hundreds of emails most people with ready to invest get. It's inspirational to, to, you know, just to read about your work uh, on, on this marriage between the um, innovation, investment, and then social responsibility and impact. Yeah. You know, I know that you've spent some time in, in Russia in the, in the early days in the Star City. Can you uh, share a little bit of that with us? Okay, well, so first of all, um, you know, I'm not, I don't invest... I went to Russia out of curiosity. Most of what I do is curiosity. And then the second thing is waste offends me. So I'm, I'm really not trying to do good. I'm trying to fix all the errors I see. You know, stupid ways to spend money, stupid ways things don't work, stupid, stupid ways people spend their time when they could be spending their time either more usefully or having fun, but not doing something stupid. Uh, so I went to Russia in 1989 because I had a few weeks empty in 1989 and I knew someone who was going on a trip and I asked if I could come and be their translator, which was kind of a joke because I'd learned Russian in high school, but I certainly wasn't good enough to be a translator. I was still better than they were. So 1989, May, April... The Berlin Wall was still up, but a lot of things were happening. And it was an amazing place. 
but nothing worked. Uh, their idea of a business was like they they were not comfortable. Just as uh, Max Gerwitz showed earlier, people's notion of business was a bunch of criminals. And so the software startups, they didn't want to call their businesses companies. They called them cooperatives. And they didn't want to discuss ownership structure. So they, it was like a marriage with 19 people, but nobody said what would happen if there was a divorce. And it, it was a wonderful place full of hope and excitement and completely yeah, a complete mess as far as anybody trying to actually build a business was concerned. So I thought I would never go back. I went back two more times in 1989 and then I was actually in, in Budapest uh, over Christmas. The Ceausescu's were caught and executed and I was sort of watching this on TV. I couldn't understand Hungarian but I could and I felt homesick for something. It was Russia for some reason. So I spent a lot of time in this region, more more in Ljubljana, the sort of the northern parts of the Balkans, and of course Poland and so forth. And this was where I did my first investing because the amount of money you could you could take a much smaller amount of money here and make a real difference. And at the time, I was still a journalist, so I didn't want to invest in the U.S. because I would have a conflict of interest. And I had a newsletter in Eastern Europe, which I closed down in order to become an investor here. And then I decided I really liked it, so I started doing it in the U.S. And you decided to do it in the United States as well. Yeah. You know, knowing the transition that happened over, over the time, especially the impact technology had, um, what would you say were the highlights of your work? And the, and the impact on the businesses that you have supported during this time? My impact yeah. on them or no, no, their the, impact the, on the, the impact, world? The imbis, uh, impact of the businesses you have invested. You know, Can you highlight um, some of the well, businesses? So one is 23andMe, which yeah. allows individual people to understand their genome. And ma many people think only doctors should see this information or maybe they won't understand it. And I'm... I'm a big believer, not just in freedom of information, but in people's access to their own information. So that's been a pretty important one. Uh, I was an investor in Flickr, which probably wasn't quite so important politically, but is one of my favorite companies. Uh, it's, it's sort of a pre-Instagram and not quite as immediate. It was before cell phones. Um, not was, that many selfies. Not that many selfies, yeah. In fact, well, I mean, the interesting thing about Flickr is most, most 80% of photos on Facebook are of people. 80% of photos on Flickr have no people, or some such numbers. I'm, I'm not sure they're exact, but it's, it's a different, it's for art, whereas Facebook is people. We, we had the presentation earlier talking about the role of women in, in the society, in the business, in, in yeah. industry. It says also in the brochure, the most influential woman. Would you care to, to comment on that? Um, it's a pity there aren't more women who are more influential. And, you know, the best thing I can do for women is not to talk about women, but just to be one and to talk about other things, whatever it is, the stuff I'm interested in. So. Thank you. Before we continue, I wanted to take a couple of questions from the audience before we go to the to the next day. So, anybody have any question? Hi, everyone. Oops, I'm Mielma. Um I was googling, and then I decided to come in here with with your story, and I saw your pictures on Flickr, and you had a lot of pictures of pools, and I was just curious. And I know Kushrim has mentioned that you. You on, on a regular basis, you have this habit of swimming and that you keep it kind of, you don't lose a day that you do that. And I'm just curious to know from kind of a personal experience, how do you manage? I can imagine you're very busy and you, you travel a lot and how do you stick to that and why is it pools and swimming specifically? Okay, um, so why? I think I would probably be an alcoholic or 
something. It's because I live a very busy life. I love my life. I, you know, I have the most interesting life of anybody I know. And it's nonstop. But every day I spend 50 minutes thinking about what I did, what I'm going to do, what I did wrong, what I did right. Should I make this investment? Should I cancel this trip? Uh, what should I say at this talk? And it's, it just keeps my life even. It's, it's just amazing. Um, as to how I manage it, before I go on a trip, not at the last moment, I suddenly say, I need this. But before I go, I say, I'd love to do this, but only if you can arrange for a swimming pool tomorrow morning at Vermitsa, is it? Uh, outdoors. I hope it's not too cold, but uh, it's, people need different things, but I think it's really, really important to simply have time to reflect each day, both backwards and forwards. So that's what I do. And it's, it's healthy physically as well, but it's, it's for the mind. Hi, I'm Cherik. I'm a tech blogger since many years now. Um, I have a question in terms of uh, your ideas for the future fields of investment in tech companies. Uh, you mentioned that uh, to you it's important the team. Of course, always it's important the team. And where do you see your investments going in this direction? And also, do you think, uh, do you think that you're going to come to a stage where you will say, I've had enough? and you will retreat and enjoy life, or you will just be what you've been doing constantly and just continue doing this yeah. always? Well, I'm enjoying life already, <laughs> uh, so I don't need to wait. In, in terms of teams, it simply means it's part of what you look for when you look for an investment in general. I mean, it, it's, it's not heading in any particular direction, but Again, as Max said, a bad idea executed by good people, they'll turn it into a good idea if they're good enough. But a bad team will will mess up what you started with. Uh, I mean, and obviously there are teams that are good for certain ideas and not good for other ideas, so it needs to be well matched. Um, what was, what did I miss? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, personally, I'm I'm very much focused on health and producing health right now. Things that really fascinate me include 3D printing, which I think is less about making beautiful chairs and much more about logistics and recycling and changing inventories. You know, if you really do 3D printing, you won't need to ship spare parts around. You'll be able to do much more recycling in a more distributed way, you'll still be mass manufacturing some things, but it, it really changes where you can run businesses because you have spare parts that you can make on site. And, and frankly, for space travel, 3D printing is going to be the only way. You're not going to take tools up to Mars. You're, you're going to ship a small printer, and then you're going to mine metal locally and 3D print things there. I want to continue with the, you know, we can go back if yeah. there is in the meantime any other question. I wanted to go back, you know, I've seen the, the long list of, of companies on whose, whose board you sit. You know, what's your role, specific role in, in, the, in, the, in the companies, in the board? Ah, because, yeah. you know, we all have our favorite board members and each one of them has a role. So what, I'm curious to know your role in the board. Well, my role is very much not finance. Unfortunately, in many ways, it's regime change. Uh, Regime change. It's, it's supposed to be slightly funny, but not really. Uh, most companies go through changes of management. You know, sometimes it's the CEO. Sometimes it's other people. But it's one of the most difficult things for companies to do, to, to go through the stages of growth. And for better or worse, I'm, I'm one of the people who... I'm much more interested in the team and the team dynamics and how the team has to change, certainly, than the finances. Uh, but but change does not come naturally. No. You know, it must be the, the toughest fight in the company. Yeah. I mean, well, change is hard whether you're a country, a company, or a person. 
because to some extent, change means saying, well, you know, what worked before isn't working now. And that's okay, but what people hear is, what you are doing is stupid. And we know better, we're gonna change it. So it's, it's, it's very hard for people to understand how the circumstances change that they need to respond in a new way because they think the success they've had so far proves that they're smart. Often it simply proves that they were lucky. So the, the challenge, the changing dynamics, um, one of the more interesting companies in fact was founded, that I'm on the board of, was founded by Paul Meyer, yep. who's the co-founder of the IPCO Foundation. And the company originally collected data on cell phones in Africa, primarily. And it turned out that wasn't a very good business. We ended up moving most of the business to the US, which was kind of sad because we really had this vision of doing good in Africa and making money. And we were not doing much good in Africa and we were making no money. <laughs> So then we came to the US and, and changed the strategy, but that was extremely difficult. Part of it was the board, some of the board just wanted us to go to the US and make money, some of us wanted to stay in Africa. And we were now going through yet another change from a company that's focused on selling to health insurance companies. This is getting somewhat too detailed. But we're, we're having to change our approach. We need to look at our customers differently because instead of being just patients, they are now people with cell phones. We're competing with a lot of digital health companies. And that's requiring a change in management and a change in relationships in the company. And I love making this stuff work. But for a lot of investors, it's just scary. And they want to look at the numbers and not deal with it. Yeah, I mean, looking at the, you know, the lack of change, the status quo in so many areas in the business created opportunities for a lot of new companies to come in and, and, and take it. You know, we'll look at the telecoms today. We'll look at the even taxi companies, the latest victim of, of yes. status quo. And, you know, it's like the, all these new opportunities yeah. are being created. Well, I mean, the best companies... So you could say the taxi companies are the victims of Uber, but the reality... I mean, there are a lot of things wrong with Uber. They, they have a poisonous culture. Yep. Uh, they're politically inept, but they're brilliant with algorithms, and they are creating a new market. They're not simply replacing taxis. They're making it so convenient to take a car that people no longer buy cars. People take trips they wouldn't otherwise take. It's, so I'm very intimately connected with this because I never learned how to drive. And I know exactly how difficult it is to get from place to place if you don't drive. And until Uber, taxis were all, taxis were terrible. Buses were complicated. And Uber is creating far more rides. It's reducing accidents of people who are drinking. It's, it's creating a new market fundamentally. And it's also leaning into the millennials who also prefer not to own cars. I'm just really ahead of my time. <laughs> Definitely. But it's, that's why I like it, not because it's killing taxis, but because it's creating something new. Yep, the, the talking about the usefulness. Yeah. You know, do we have any other question? Hi, my name is uh, Tauland, I'm from Bea. And uh, just let me say, start off, you're such a great inspiration to us. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, talking about inspirations leads me to my question. Um, We've read so much on the internet, and they might be rumors, might not be rumors, but are you leaving this planet? <laughs> and not, uh, not please yet. talk. Not, not yet. yet. Okay, okay. And that would be my question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would, I would like to retire on Mars, but not until they're ready for me, and that's going to be at least 30 years. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Oh. Awesome women on Mars. Um, one, my question is, so we're here in Kosovo, and talking about entrepreneurial activity, um, what places outside of the US have you seen exciting entrepreneurs 
And what are they working on? What areas are they pursuing in their startups? Uh, so it varies a lot. I mean, I've, people do come from the most unlikely places. One of my more interesting companies is actually Croatian, and it sells banking software in Africa. So it didn't fit anybody's screen. It was, you know, the fintech people didn't like it because it was Croatian. The African investors didn't like it also because it was Croatian. The Central European investors thought if they were selling in Africa, what's the point? Um, so, but in terms of hotbeds, Estonia was definitely one. And it's interesting because Estonia was such a small country. I think in general, you find more international minded. That's not necessarily the same as innovation, but it is it is focused on export and larger than your home market in small countries because people there inherently speak more than one language and they know they need to go outside their home market to be successful. So you have more, more native entrepreneurs in places like Estonia or most of the Central European countries than you do either in Germany or France. Uh, Berlin is now becoming something of a hotbed, but really where I found a lot of the innovation and the startups were in these smaller places. Moscow looked really great for a while, but now it doesn't look so good. Um, you know, it, each country has a bunch of startups if you go look, and it's, it's really hard to pick one. I'm not a big fan of Silicon Valley. I think it's too inward looking. And right now, New York City is becoming more tech centric. But the, the best thing about New York City is that the people in it don't all, they're not all in the same business. So in New York, even if you're in the tech sector, you need to be exposed to advertising or publishing or finance or all these other industries. And I think that the cross culture nature outside of Silicon Valley is really important for understanding the rest of the world's problems. Do we have any other question? Related to the same question, uh, have you ever invested or supported or helped other startups outside of US? Yes. Um, I'm on the boards of two Russian companies, Yandex and Luxoft, which is now becoming less and less Russian, unfortunately for Russia. Uh, I'm, I mentioned Aradian in Croatia. I've, I've done quite a few investments in Poland originally. I have a couple currently. One is called Algorithmic, which is a heart monitor. Um, I have four other investments in Africa, uh, a, a lot in Russia that I'm not on the boards of. So yes. and. To be honest, I don't advise everybody to do that because I think people don't really know what they're doing when they go outside their own country. But I speak Russian, and then I'm an angel investor, and I'm just free to do what I like anyway. <laughs> so the, the African companies I invested in are, again, sort of what I mentioned earlier. One of them is very local. It So in Africa, I think, you're probably familiar with this. When you buy airtime on your cell phone, you get a little scratch card and you scratch it off. So what this company does is they have a printer and it prints the code. And when you print the code in real time, you can print advertising on it as well that is both local and real time. But now this company has, has basically become a sales force. And what we're really investing in is human capital, training people. And so even though it's, again, it's a profit-making company, but it does something useful, and it's also building local capacity. OK, uh, another question. Sure. Uh, since you have invested in many different regions in the world, and uh, you have seen that um, most of them have a different uh, culture of doing business, so how you find uh, found yourself within those companies and within those teams 
I mean, if you can share an experience regarding this, let's say, investment in Russia or in Africa or in, in Europe or in US, any comparisons? I, I can share so many experiences. Um, so let's say in Russia, people are not very good managers. In fact, they're mostly terrible. Uh, in this country, and in most of Central Europe, people have uncles and grandfathers and grandmothers and just, there are people who remember what it was like before communism. In Russia, there really was not. And so people didn't know how to manage. They, you hired people, as someone said earlier, you hire your cousin because you know where he lives and he's your cousin. It doesn't really matter if he's very good. And there's still that culture of lack of trust of people you don't know. And so the first thing is just trying to, trying to help your team become better managers. And of course, there's a culture that says, well, training, you know, this is soft stuff. We're engineers, we're number people, we're scientists. We don't need this soft business stuff. And trying to explain, show, motivate, help, help to change that culture. And it's, it's not simply that people argue with you. It's how do you make them really understand that and feel it and become good managers? Uh, I mean, communication skills, writing skills, the, those really matter even though they are not they seem to be soft and foolish, but they, they're very important to creating a team that's productive, that comes in and works on weekends, that, that's willing to change, that's, that has the courage to do what is really a very scary thing, especially in a country where the safe thing is either to stay on your farm or to go work for the government. So, you know, partly you find the right teams, but then the teams need to grow and hire people and they need to learn how to manage, and also, if you were a Russian and you started one business, you just were terrified that that would be the last business you ever had, so you would not let go. And again, learning to do the regime change, learning, you know, it's not really fun to be CEO. It's, it's a lot of work. It's more fun to be founder and chief scientist and let somebody else do the managing. So th those are the, what I like to say is Russian engineers are engineers squared and American salespeople are salespeople squared and a company needs both. Hi, I'm just behind the camera here. I'm sure you don't see me. Um, I'm going to ask a question about a topic that we discussed more yesterday than today, but it was about concentration of powers into big companies like Facebook and Google. So do you, do you see a problem there? Is my first question. And then how do you think venture capital investors can count react or should they at all? Well, venture capital investors react by saying, gee, I wish I owned Facebook. <laughs> and, and they buy it. It, I mean, it's interesting. If you look at the current valuations of something like Facebook, or forget Facebook, look at all the unicorns. Facebook is public, but look at all the unicorns. The original investors put their money in quite cheaply. The later investors put their money in, and they have a term sheet that gives them a preference so that they might buy 1% of the company for 10 million, but if the company gets sold, they get more than 10 million back. So because of the term sheet, those valuations are not actually real. And the VCs invest in these companies not for the money, but so that they can list them in their portfolios. So right now, you, I, I just wanted to explain that. I think there's a lot of unrealistic valuations. But back to your question about concentration. I think 
I think it's a big problem, but I also think it usually gets solved, not because someone else is going to beat Google, but because the market's going to move. And it's going to move just the same thing that happened to Microsoft. And at the same time, what happened to Microsoft, in addition to Google and all these other things, is Microsoft itself became, even while it was being sued by the US government, it became sort of like a government itself. It, it became so broad it had to serve everybody. And it, it lost its capacity to innovate. Uh, it, you know, if, if you stop, companies kind of reach some natural pinnacle and then something else new comes and doesn't replace them but just moves the center of gravity. Now, you could argue maybe this won't happen with Google because it will move into self-driving cars or into all kinds of interesting stuff out of Google X. I don't really know. But I do know that search itself is becoming a very different marketplace as so much activity, and this is because I'm on the board of Yandex, as so much of search activity is now moving on to mobile phones and more and more search is becoming vertical. You no longer go to Google, you go to a restaurant app or you go to a, and of course they're trying to compete with Yelp, but I think the market changes faster. And so with luck, the market will take care of any company becoming too powerful. If it doesn't, you know, there is antitrust and stuff like that, but I think in the end, it's usually the market moving rather than the governments that take care of this concentration because the world has become much more dynamic. It's, it's so much easier to start a business. It's so much harder to maintain one. Very well said. You know, be before we conclude the conference, I, I just wanted to have a question from you for the audience and whose answer are we going to follow up online in social media in the blogging and in in our in our website okay this is slightly canned but so this is for you to answer and to be discussed at next year's conference what technological development would be most useful for the balkans but and that you can you can Define useful however you want, whether it's economically, politically. Uh, is it making Balkans rich? Is it making your lives more pleasant? But what technology is most useful for the Balkans in the next year? Esther, thank you very much for being here tonight. <laughs>